Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, as Maggie mentioned, uh, I'm a product manager at Mayant. We do have a booth in the back, so if this explanation to what we do didn't really make sense, please come talk to us after the presentation. Today, I'm going to be talking about how we can improve social connectedness via textiles. So as a product manager, I really like to approach every product that we create with a problem statement. So this allows us to better understand what we're building the product for. So with this presentation, I wanted to present a product statement. And today, we'll be looking at social isolation. And what we mean by social isolation is really the lack of meaningful connections that you have to yourself or to the people around you. So I'll be taking a look at the causes of social isolation, um, what that has as an impact on our health, and how we can remedy that. The first cause is a change in family structures. So an example of this is smaller families are actually um, being built, and you have more divorces, as well as families are more geographically dispersed. This means you have less of a direct connection to some of your greatest support system. We spend more of our physical time at work, as well as more of our mental time at work. That means even when you leave work, finally, at the end of a long day, you're still getting emails, you're still getting Slack messages, and you have less time to actually disconnect and have time for yourself, as well as time to socially interact with the people around you. Lastly, we have television, smartphones as an integral part of our everyday lives, meaning we have direct access to entertainment, content, right at our fingertips. So an example of how this might cause whoops, sorry, social isolation, I'm actually going to get some audience participation here. And be honest, how many people have canceled plans to stay in and watch Netflix? <laughs> All right, we got some dishonest people in the audience. <laughs> so again, why does this all matter? We're lonely, we're watching Netflix. How does this impact our health? Well, social isolation has actually been linked to exacerbate existing health conditions. This is especially prominent in an elderly population. So you can see some examples of how that happens here. So what's the solution? Well, I'd like to use an example. It's personal to me, and it's my grandfather. He's recently had a heart attack. He lives in another city very far away. So I call him up and ask him how he's doing. He says, oh, you know, I'm OK. I'm getting better. I'm getting through it. So what does that mean? I don't really know how he's doing. I don't understand how he's doing. So I can't change where he is geographically. And no one's going to pry my smartphone away from my cold, dead hands. So why don't we use that technology to create a digital presence where I can really understand what's going on with my grandfather and reestablish that meaningful connection to him? The first step in that is through biometric data. So what biometric data allows us to do is get an accurate picture of what's going on with that person's health and their well-being. And we believe the best way to do that is through textiles. So textiles covers almost 100% of our body. You can see right now I'm almost head to toe covered in textiles. It covers almost 100% of the society. If you look around, everybody right now is touching some form of textile. And it covers 24 hours of our lives, whether you're sitting on a couch at home, sleeping in a bed, walking around in your clothes, you are interacting with textiles at all times. What this continuous and ambient interaction allows us to do is create more longitudinal data capture of the person's biometrical data. This allows us to make more informed health and wellness decisions, as well as feed that data into algorithms that can create a baseline of your health and begin to see if you are deviating from that baseline. This allows us to predict a decline in health, as well as eventually even serious health events. What we do here is shift from a reactive model of care to a preventative one. So I gave my grandfather a shirt that monitors his heart rate. And I'm keeping track of this on my phone. And I get an alert that says he has an elevated heart rate. What does this mean? What do I do with this information? Is he in trouble? Do I need to call 911? Is he lying in bed sleeping? Is he sitting on his couch watching the Discovery Channel? Or is he out for a walk with his friends? In which case, an elevated heart rate is probably a good thing. So biometric data on its own isn't really enough for us to understand what's going on with that person. We need environmental data to provide context to that biometric data. 
So this can come from IoT sensors, as we've been talking about today. It can even come from something as simple as a location on his phone. What that helps us do is create that more holistic digital presence of that person. Lastly, as we're capturing all of this data and presenting it to the user, in order for them to have that meaningful understanding of what's happening with the person, we have to pay very much attention to how we're presenting that data. So just presenting heart rate, steps, things like that to a user isn't very helpful. They don't know what to do with that. They don't know how to interpret that. So what we need to do is interpret that in data and provide them with information, so insights into that data. We then aggregate that information to create knowledge, which really is a predictive um, trend. Sorry, I keep pressing this thing. <laughs> a predictive trend of what's going on with that person's health. Lastly, that gets us to wisdom, which is when we start providing feedback with actionable insights and behavior modification nudges to be able to help those people improve their health. So with all of this, I can get that digital presence of my grandfather, really know and understand how his health is, and reestablish that meaningful connection through a digital presence. So I'd like to end the presentation with something that you can take away, talk to your family about, tweet about, whatever you want to do with it. The first is that isolation exacerbates health conditions, especially in the elderly population. Textiles can better capture biometric information through a comfortable, continuous monitoring in a non-habit-changing way that's comfortable to the users. And lastly, we can combine this biometric data with environmental data for context which allows us to create that digital presence, understand what's happening with the other person, and reestablish those meaningful connections to yourself, to the people around you, and to healthcare professionals. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Any questions? All the way at the back. Uh, hello. Uh, so I had one question. Um, how do you measure isol degree of isolation in an elderly person? I mean, is there any sort of method for that? In terms of measuring the degree of isolation? Yes. I'm not too familiar with how they measure it. Mm -hmm. I believe a lot of it would be subjective. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they would correlated the uh, subjective feeling of isolation to an increase in, um, the, or sorry, a decline in the health of the person. Oh, I see, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, quite an inter interesting product you have got there. So I, I was just wondering, uh, since you are gathering a lot of information about someone's, li uh, someone's lifestyle, uh, calling it uh, biometric information, so how do you manage to uh, keep it secure? That's a lot of information for someone's personal life, right? Um, so, of course, we're collecting lots of very personal health information. So, like any medical product and how MedStack talked about earlier today, we got to make sure we're compliant with all the different standards um, that are put out by governments, different um, organizations like the FDA and Health Canada. If we're seeking medical approval, which we are for some of our products, that follows a whole other set of standards. So, we make sure that we follow all of those. Also, because we care a lot about sharing that health information, we make sure that every single um, data point that you're sharing, you have control over who you're sharing it with and when you're sharing that information. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, just a quick question. I guess you're talking a lot about seniors' care and working with seniors every day. Um, I'm just also thinking about and potentially it's a silly thing to bring up about a consent and that person's ability to give that consent to share. It's one thing to protect the data. It's one thing to say you're going to share the data. Um, but the example you gave is like giving a shirt to your grandfather who may or may not know that you're collecting all this information. And it's one of those things that I think on the super kind of superficial level, we can all say, oh yeah, you know, no one would do that. But as a healthcare provider, you would be shocked <laughs> uh, what family members are willing to go to and what they're actually not able to do. So I guess from an implementation point, how do you see that affecting? How do you navigate that? 
um, just in the example you provided. Um, yeah, so from a very high level, all of the biometric information that we're capturing is uh, wellness-based, so we're not actually capturing any medical information until um, we get that medical certification. For them to be able to allow us to capture that, we would require a prescription from a physician. So if we want to monitor their ECG for certain arrhythmias or things like that, um, we would get a prescription from physician first before we would unlock that feature. Um, on the other hand, we do you know, try to combine it with things like location, um, in which case, you're right, it is important that we do have consent from the user. Um, and part of what we're doing is establishing different onboarding strategies in terms of if somebody else is a um, admin for somebody else and setting that up for somebody else, we want to make sure that they have that person's consent and the right to sign that person up for our product. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned a, a t-shirt for your grandfather, but I'm wondering, um, is that the prototype? Like, what textiles are you using right now, and sort of what are you envisioning um, in the future as you potentially develop your product? So the first product that we're actually launching for biometric sensing is actually an underwear. Um, you can actually see it at our booth if you'd like. So the reason we chose an underwear, it's because it's ubiquitous across everybody, whether you're elderly, newborn, well, maybe not newborn, but <laughs> if you're female, male, um, you wear underwear, hopefully, for the majority of your day, whether you're sleeping, whether you're walking. It's discreet. It's underneath all of your clothing, so you don't know that, you, well, other people don't know that you're being monitored. And it's continuous, so it's always on your body. So that allows us to get a more accurate, uh, capture of your data throughout your entire day and get a more accurate picture of who you are. And yes, it does come in lots of styles and colors. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Andre.